that works with the Ministry of Education and I've asked to share within the next 20 minutes about what we do. So, first of all, um, since we're about equality, right, um, this is a picture to me that demonstrates what equality is all about, right? Everybody, um, I normally feel like the shorter guy as well, most of the time, um, everybody gets a box each, right? Equity is that the shorter guy, someone like me, gets two boxes to look over the, the fence uh, so that I can watch the game as well, right? But Teach Malaysia is about equity, but in the end of the day, we want to be about systemic reform. First of all, why is there a fence there that blocks people from looking in? Maybe it's a baseball game, fair enough, but it's a symbol for larger access to education and quality education at that as well, right? So what's happening in Malaysia? Can you read out the first the one over here? 44% of the in Malaysia will not be minimum in Malaysia for basic degree level in Okay, thank you. Can you read the, this one over here on the okay. right? Yeah. 60% <laughs> uh, uh, of 14 years old in Malaysia do not be minimum in Malaysia for basic level in mathematics. Right. And the last one. One out of five Malaysian children do not complete their secondary school education. These are the stats um, that are in the Malaysian Education Blueprint, as well as the PISA results or run by OECD. What is PISA? What is OECD? Please Google that. Right? Um, our 14-year-olds in Malaysia, the average 14-year-old, probably not in this room, but across Malaysia, the average, is actually three years behind the 14-year-olds in Singapore. Compared to 14-year-olds that grew up in uh, Shanghai, China specifically, we're four years behind. Right? Scary thoughts. Now, this is what the stats don't tell us. Right? I work after school to help support my family. No one in my community has gone to university. I didn't pass UPSR, and it's too hard to catch up. These are the stories that sometimes our fellows, our participants, and I also hear. I just was part of a WhatsApp group in my, uh, from the office, and we were running an event there. And there's actually a student that grew up in Klang that is sharing he had to work since he was in Standard 2. Klang, Standard 2, and we're not even talking anywhere further outside of Slango yet, right? But this is the challenges that some of the children growing up in low-income communities face. It's not about reading and writing. Sometimes it's just about being happy, and sometimes it's just about like, having food on the table as well. Now, what, what, with, given all of this, right, what can we actually do about the problem? Teach Major's approach is that we believe that leadership is actually the key. Leadership in the classroom, leadership in the community, leadership in schools, districts, state levels, but more importantly, leadership in the students themselves. They have to feel empowered, right? So Teach Major recruits a diverse range of outstanding leaders, graduates that never considered a career in teaching. So they could be engineers, lawyers, accountants, but they decide, but we reach out to them and say, actually, hey, there's a bigger problem up there that we need to solve, and that's education inequity. A child's background most often determines their outcome in life. We then, we then put them through a training program, um, and we place them as full-time teachers in schools. Now, this two-year program is not a volunteer program. Volunteers running for two years will be hard to sustain yourselves. We actually get paid through the Ministry of Education. So you receive a salary through the Ministry of Education, and it's more of a service-orientated program. So not volunteering, but service, something a bit more longer term. And then after the two, in the two years, they have to teach math, science, history, or English. But it's not about teaching subjects. It's about teaching children. That in the end of the day, there are children that need to learn a lot more about life, about ambition, about aspirations, about values. And we inculcate that in our lessons through teamwork, project-based working. And that gets kids to see that there's a different way of studying maths, where it's not all about like one over four, but you could study maths in the sense of deforestation rates that's happening, right? You have to make it relevant in that sense. And after the two years, no matter how much the kids have taught the students, I guarantee you that the participants will learn a lot more about themselves and about Malaysia. They would learn that it's not the lack of opportunities, neither is it the lack of ability, but it's the lack of a system that is supportive of them, of the kids growing up in low-income communities. 
So we wanted to cultivate long-term leadership in our alumni. Many of you, uh, if those are Malaysians in the crowd, you would have heard of the MCKK group, of the uh, Tengku Kursia, R RMC, VI, St. John's, right? I hope in the next five or ten years, you're going to hear a lot more about Teach Malaysia alumni doing a lot more amazing things in education as well as outside of education, driving for systemic reform and systemic change. What, okay, so, so far it's just a bunch of icons and what does that actually mean, Zam? Right? So here's a story of Hamsa Veni. She actually did a bachelor degree in medicine um, in China and now she's in a second year teaching English in a fairly low performing, underperforming school in SMK Lutong, Sarawak. Part of this school also serves a community of kids that come from low socioeconomic background. In their district, um, and she was put in charge of the English debate team as well. So in their district, the debate competition is always won by a school for the last seven years running non-stop in one of the higher performing schools as well. So suddenly Hamza Veni was given this challenge and the students and they said like, hey, what, take this challenge and train these kids on English debate. And if any of you guys know, like there's choral speaking, there's drama classes, and then there comes debate. That's a, that's a super high order thinking skills. Uh, in terms of analyzing, creating, and then synthesizing thought all at once, right? Her school, these five girls, all of them as well from minority backgrounds in Sarawak, became district champions and then went on to become state champions, beating some of the high-performing schools in Kuching, like St. Joseph's and St. Teresa, right? She did this in a span of like four or five months of working and coaching with them rigor rigorously. What does that tell you for the girls? that they suddenly became champions, how do you think they felt after that? What do you think their parents felt about them? How did the narrative in the school change? Our school can actually win competitions. Our school can be great if we work hard towards it. Sometimes all you need are small proof points of change to, to make people believe or have a sense of possibility. Now, Great Zam, that's one person, five schools, what else can happen? There's 150 alumni so far of Teach Major, and there's about 100 more in the program for the, in the year one or year two teaching. Um, but the 150 alumni, uh, some, five of them are running this program called Gusto. They're running a program, Gusto, that's training up to 160 other teachers on 21st century skills. So these 160 teachers can have an experience ranging from 0 to 20 or 25 years and they're suddenly, suddenly listening to a, this young bunch of alumni uh, around new ways of teaching. Why? Because they've demonstrated success in the classroom. They, they're not seen as an outsider, they're seen as equals in the class and in the school and they've seen that these five alumni care a lot about the, class, about the students in the class. From there, they're able to work together and actually change the lessons. Sometimes some of the schools I walk into there, it feels like I'm going into an international school in terms of how engaged the students are and how student-centric the lessons are. Aros Academy, um, for alumni, and I don't know if you guys heard, um, MDEC announced that they're rewriting the computer science curriculum to include programming. How many of you guys heard about that, read that article? Hands up, right? In that, Aros Academy, or the, the four people involved with Aros, were appointed last year to actually rewrite the curriculum and work with the Ministry of Education. They were also appointed by MDEC to then train the 22 pilot schools, which had 44 teachers. They were also appointed by MDEC to also train about 20 or 30 batches, I can't remember the exact number, of new teachers coming through the system on programming and computational thinking skills that children need to know for the 21st century. That their max, they, at that point when they were appointed, they had no more than two and a half years of teaching experience. Yet they were able to do this. I never thought that we would see someone rewriting a curriculum probably until year 10 or year 12. So for me also, with, with my high sense of possibility, I'm also surprised by what is capable. So my rule of thumb in terms of like setting a high bar for the alumni, and they just exceeded, now I, have to like, I need a few boxes to go higher. Um, another project that came out of nowhere, uh, two alumni also suddenly, they were supposed to be fundraising for TFM, uh, but then they ended up having a lot of fun fundraising for student projects, and they started a program called 100% 100, 100 Project. Um, crowdfunding platform, 
and I think so far in about six or seven months or, or one year, maybe they raised 380,000 ringgit uh, from the public for teacher programs. Not just TFM fellows, any teacher that wants to sign up for this program and sign up on the course that they did. So there's a lot of, like these are all like the, the big shiny moments of the alumni making change. But there's also alumni that's doing change just in the classroom by being that excellent teacher, by being that friend, coach, mother, father to their students that they need to give them that belief that you're smart, you're capable, you're beautiful, you're handsome, you can make a difference in your life. That's all a child really needs because if you tell them that over and over, guess what happens? They start believing that and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in short also, what can you, we're, we're trying to recruit another 500 for the next, next five years. Refer your friend, donate, fundraise for us. Um, 25 ringgit a month online helps us reach one student, like, sort of like WWF, UNICEF sort of style. Um, be a campus leader. If you're teaching or you're still studying in schools, be a campus leader and recruit some of your friends to even join. A lot of our campus leaders join the program themselves and then bring five or six of their friends together to do it. Uh, be a fellow. It's two years. It might seem long or short. And if you're not, and if you're, you have children or nephews or nieces, allow them to be fellows. Some of the scariest things sometimes for me is that people that actually oppose their own children to be teachers are teachers themselves because they've seen how challenging the situation is. So just want to leave you guys with just this sense of possibility and hope that change is possible. And thank you very much.